Good morning. It's great to be here with you folks again. Pine Land, were you listening during the scripture reading? Do you remember what he read? No. Philippians chapter 1. That's not where I'm going to be preaching this morning, but it, it, it sort of leads us in the right direction when we hear what the Apostle Paul is saying there. And it also helps. I, I know that we were told that you wanted us to share a little bit about our own journey and, and that sort of thing. But the very first verse that Paul says there, he, in, in, I think it's verse 12, he says, the things that have happened to me have turned out to further the gospel. The gospel is being advanced. And I guess we could say that's a little bit of our, our own testimony as well. We know certainly in the Apostle Paul's circumstance, I mean, he, he started his ministry in Philippi in the jail. Do you remember that? He was preaching. He got thrown in jail. He and Silas were there singing in the middle of the night. And, and God was glorified. And now he's writing the book of Philippians from jail. And he's writing to the people in Philippi and he's saying, you know, don't worry. Don't worry about what's going on because the things that, that have happened to me have helped further the gospel. And it was such an in, incredible testimony that he was giving. And it's a testimony that I could, I could say for ourselves as well. Um, the gospel's going forward. God keeps working through us even though everything that happens is not exactly the way we would like it to happen, right? We have a lot of things that go on in our lives that are, are challenging. I mean, we felt called to go to Peru. We knew that's where God wanted us to go. And it took a, a long time in getting there. God worked through us and, and through the circumstances. And, and, and we, we arrived there. We were there 15 years. And we weren't thinking of being there just 15 years. Uh, we sold our home up here. We built a home down there. We thought, you know, we're here for the rest of our lives. And we didn't feel like we were called to come home. But all of a sudden, God put, starts putting things together, and we realize, yeah, this is what he wants. And it wasn't such a, a glorious thing to say, oh, I'm, I'm called to leave. But as we look at our lives, and as we look at, uh, at what happens, at what God's doing, we realize, you know what, the things he's doing are for the gospel. The, the, the gospel plan that God has is much bigger than any of us, much bigger than our circumstances, much bigger than, than our strategies. You've heard from a lot of people over this weekend. It's been a good weekend. I've appreciated hearing everybody I've heard speak about missions and about what they're doing. But you know, it's, it's not about it's not about our agency or the area we're working in. It's not about our ambition. Any of these other thoughts are simply, they're subtitles. Subtitles to, to what God is doing in, in sharing His glorious gospel with the rest of the world. And we all have a small part in that. We're all, we're all working together. And the church needs to have this attitude that the gospel is what is most important. And God will direct that work. He knows what He's doing. His future, the future is laid out. And he, he has it all planned. And so we just have to be working along with him. And so I thought, what can I do? What can we, we talk about this morning that will help us understand God's plan in his great ministry and how we can fit in with it? And of course, I, I, I went to that great missionary story in 2 Kings chapter 5. You remember that one. It's not where Jesus gave the Great Commission. That didn't happen there. It was a little bit later on. Do you remember what happened in 2 Kings chapter 5? Right in the middle of Kings, the book of Kings. The book of Kings used to be all one. You know, there's 1 and 2 Kings. You know why there's 1 and 2 Kings? Because the scroll was too big. So they had to rip it in half. Seriously. And that's the only reason there's a first and a second. It was the story of the kings. And right in the middle of that, there is this, this story that helps us 
I believe, understand what our mission is and how we fit into it. So let's pray, let's ask God to lead us, and then let's read his word. Father, help us. We come before you this morning, a needy people. We understand your salvation. We understand that in Christ, in his gospel, in our salvation, we have everything, everything we need. But often in this life, as we look at circumstances, things going on around us, and as we even look at our own abilities, our own, well, we fail often in terms of our own obedience. We come to you again and say, Lord, lead us, teach us, direct us, fill us so that we might do your work in your power, in your way. And so we ask, open our hearts right now. Help us, forgive us uh, for, for sin that is in our lives. Lord, help us to be just vessels ready to be used by you in this world. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You probably got your Bibles open. You probably saw the name right there in the first line or so. You're going, oh, that story. Naaman, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him, interesting, the Lord had given victory to Syria. Who was Syria's enemy? Israel. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and so spoke the little girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Israel said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothing, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. He tore his clothes, the king of Israel, and said, I, Am I God to kill and to make alive? that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses, his chariots. He stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry. He went away saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me, stand and call upon the name of the Lord, and wave his hand over the place, and cure the leper. Are not Abin and Farpar, the, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? He's actually said to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, and he and all his company. And he came and he stood before him and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now this present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, Elijah said, Elisha said, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mules load of earth. For from now on your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but to the Lord. 
In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the house of Rimmon, a false god, to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. And Elisha said to him, Go in peace. You might be saying, What on earth does this story have to do with missions? We have a mission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. How is this Old Testament story going to help us? You know, I believe if we read and understand this story and see what's going on, we'll see principles, priorities, and problems with cross-cultural mission. If we take some time, make some observations, we will grasp our role, our responsibility, and many of the risks that are involved in what I'm going to tag this morning as unconventional, incarnational, cross-cultural missions. Unconventional. God's always causing or calling us to do things that, well, we're not expecting and the world isn't expecting and, and we're maybe not comfortable with. Incarnational in the sense that Jesus Christ put on flesh and bones and came here. And that's how we're called to do missions today. You and I, we're called to incarnate Jesus Christ or allow Christ to work through us. And cross-cultural, yeah, we're called to go to the ends of the earth and we have to be honest with ourselves, even talking to our own neighbors. Our own neighbors, grown up in Canada like us, it's pretty much cross-cultural if we're coming from a Christian perspective. They're scratching their heads and going, what? Huh? This doesn't make sense with the society that we've grown up in. Christian idea, the, the idea of the gospel and a God that we must bow ourselves before. So let's, let's look at some of the characters in the story. We're going to first of all talk, talk about Naaman the Syrian, the general of the army of the enemy of Israel. And we're not talking about a trade war, a cold war. We're not talking about sanctions here. This is a brutal, violent conflict with ghastly, inhumane treatment of even the innocents. There's an offhanded mention of a little girl carried off. And we sort of breeze through that. But do we understand what that means? A little girl carried off? Do we realize that she was probably ripped from her family, her home? Were her parents both killed? It's very possible. Not unlikely. And she's taken into slavery. She's enslaved. The extent of Syria's subjugation of Israel is apparent in the fact that Naaman arrives in Israel with just a small group of soldiers. He doesn't have to come in with an army because Israel has been completely subdued. They've been beaten down. And so he just kind of waltzes in there, wanders in there with no concern whatsoever. And so we get an idea, we get an idea of the situation, the relationship between Israel and Syria, and we, we see what this man is doing. He's coming in, he wants to improve his fortunes, right? <laughs> wants to better his life. I mean, who is he? He is the general of Syria superpower of that time he has got position his ranking his 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 riches he's got it all but he's got one small problem leprosy right he's got leprosy he's got a personal issue and none of this other stuff seems to matter because of his leprosy. None, of, none of, of all that he has gained has, has helped him at all. And I, I want to ask you, does this sound familiar? Not just the personal part, that everybody in this world, or well, people around us all the time have everything, it seems. They have everything. But they've got one small nagging issue. They've got guilt. They've got a problem. 
terms of their relationship with the living God. And that makes everything else seem unimportant. Sometimes they're numb to it, sometimes they don't see it, but this, this is not really where I'm focusing. It's not the violence part. Yeah, we face a lot of, hear a lot of, about violence in the world today. But I want to talk about this part of seeking. He's seeking to improve his fortunes. He's looking for better, a better quality of life. Isn't this how people usually arrive at the gospel? You know, we can say, well, you know, we shouldn't be looking to better ourselves, you know, to fix ourselves when we come to the gospel. The way we come to the gospel is we recognize that we've offended God. We've sinned against Him, and, and we're under judgment because of our sins. But you think about it. How did you come to the gospel? I know we've been in the church for a while, and, and we, we know all the, the theology, but usually God starts working in our lives long before we recognize the truth of the gospel, and He says, you've got a problem. And we think, oh, we want to fix that problem. And so let's not condemn Naaman for looking to fix this problem and arriving in Israel. But I, I was thinking of this. Do you see, does this sound familiar for our day and age? Are there people arriving on our doorstep here in Canada seeking to better their life? improve their fortunes. Can we believe that? Come to our country, trying to better them. Wasn't that exactly what we're doing? So it's an interesting parallel here, isn't it? Helps us think, is this the way that they're going to arrive at an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ just simply because they're trying to better their life? Curious. Let's go on. Let's talk about the king of Israel. His name was Jehoram. He was the king at the time. He was the main representative of Israel politically. And only that. He was their, their ruler. There was nothing moral or spiritual about him. He was actually son of Ahab. You might remember King Ahab who brought Baal worship into Israel. Well, his son Jehoram took Baal Israel out, but he didn't turn Israel back to God. And we can read about him in 2 Kings chapter 3. It says he was an evil king, just like most of the other kings. He was not turning people back to God. Well, when he received this request or this command from the king of Syria, it seems like he had no spiritual foundation, no context in which he could, he could say, well, intentionally or unintentionally this king is looking for help from our God he threw up his hands and he says what can I do and he was suspicious he says the king of Syria he's looking for an excuse so that he can bring down more violence upon us I know what he's doing he's asked me to do something that is absolutely impossible help this general with his leprosy. And he was the king of Israel, part of the people of God. Well, it's hard to say what might have happened. What might have happened had he not been able to help Naaman and if Naaman had gone home. But let's, let's think about Elisha, Elisha the prophet, the prophet of the Lord. He, on the other hand, was a true representative of the people of God. He responds to this apparent threat with complete faith in God's ability to respond. He basically says, send Naaman to me and God will be glorified. Send him my way, we'll take care of it. It will be no problem at all. And there's not much more to be said about him. He does his job. He fulfills his role. Now, another question for you. Do you see the contrast to our day. You see, we have a king. 
in this country who naively thinks that he can cure the ills of the entire world as they arrive on our doorstep. He believes that they will become what he wants them to be as easily as he slips into the costume of another culture. And faith, well, faith doesn't matter to our king. Any faith is fine. Whatever faith, as long as that faith does not affect the way you live, it's fine with our king. As long as you don't really believe, as long as you have faith that is as ineffective as an unused library card, he's fine with it. You can carry it with you, but don't let it change the way you live, the way you operate the moral decisions that you make. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? You're catching on? Okay. I'm not trying to, trying to be parabolic here, but uh, not don't want to hide the truth completely. But then there are us, you know, people who are Christians, who believe in God, who have some biblical wisdom. We have a level of, of, of practical, truth-based wisdom. And we realize hey, faith matters. But my question is, do we have enough of that faith? Enough of that faith to be acting confidently and loving exorbitantly those who are around us in our community, whether they are new Canadians or old Canadians. You see the difference? In that time, the king was throwing up his hands and, and the man of God was saying, hey, God has this under control. In our day and age, our king is foolishly saying, you know, we can fix every. If we just give enough money to people, they'll, they'll do exactly what we want. They'll be who we want them to be. And we go, that's not true. The heart needs to change. And we're frustrated and scared because we've forgotten that we have a God who changes hearts. We have a God who wants to work in, in, in the most incredible ways. And we've lost hope in the gospel. A man named Regil, Reginald Bibby, who's a social commentator, said by the year 2015, religion would have no more impact in Canada. Around 2015 he said, I apologize, made a mistake. I didn't include in my statistics the number of evangelical Christians that would be coming into the country from other countries. You see, we're not on the losing end with all these people coming into the country. I was talking with a pastor who uh, is on the, the west coast and BC has had like waves over generations and generations waves of different influx of, of people from other cultures and he says to me something interesting he says the people who are coming the Christians who are coming from these other countries have a hope in the gospel that Canadian Christians have lost they've been through terrible things and, and have seen how God is true. His faith is real. How it can make a difference in the most desperate circumstances. And so we need to not lose hope in God's gospel in this day and age. Are we exercising our faith? Are we learning that it is something that is true? It is something that will make a difference even in the most hopeless circumstances. Are we, are we unfazed or are we unglued at this time in church history? I have another question for you. Who is the hero of this story? Who is the hero? God, of course, is the hero. We often spend so much time trying to identify our stumbling, struggling human counterparts that God is using that we forget this truth, that 
God is always the one who is laying this all out, working through people. So maybe I'll refine my question a little bit. Who is the human hero or the human or the hero humanly speaking of this story? It wasn't Naaman, it wasn't Elijah. It wasn't even Gehazi who we read about in the end of the chapter who was thinking this God's glory thing was good if you could cash in on it. Who is the one person in this story who glorifies God by stepping out with an extravagant faith, walking in an obedient trust that goes way beyond their circumstances, position, and any commonplace rational hope? Who was that person? You probably have guessed it, right? The little girl? The little slave girl? A little unnamed Israelite girl enslaved in enemy territory who after all that she had been through still believed what right does she have to believe what right does she have to believe in a sovereign caring almighty personal God after she not simply just being another person created by God in the world, but part of his chosen people is swept away in a tidal wave of violence to live in a harsh environment of a foreign culture isolated from her home, her family, and a nurturing mother. We would expect to find her curled up in a ball in a closet somewhere, falling apart. But that's not where she was. She had no real reason to believe, unless, of course, she was instructed correctly, theologically, and was convinced practically, personally, that this supposedly caring Old Testament God was both all-knowing, he knew what was going on, all-powerful he allowed it to go on and also all caring we read about this Old Testament God in Isaiah that his ways are higher than our ways Isaiah 55 8 and we need to get used to that <laughs> we go what huh why and we need to understand that God knows best. And we would be best just to follow Him. We would, in fact, enjoy life and we'd say, okay, God, I don't feel comfortable with this, but you know what's best. And you love me with a gracious love that is far beyond anything, Isaiah says, in chapter 49 anything that we would find on this earth he says that God's love is stronger and more enduring than a mother's wow can we hold on to that can we believe that think of it this little girl all that she had been through and she still trusted in God she said hey he's the answer to your problems He's the answer to my master's problems. She was willing to tell this man who had bought her as a slave, who was the enemy of her people, who'd been involved in the mass massacre of her people. She was willing to share with him good news. Wow. Wow. She wasn't because of who she was it was because of who her God was she still trusted him she still loved him I, I don't know, we don't have the details but going through what she went through she, she said, hey he cares he loves he's true and what happens in our lives 
we order something through Amazon and, and it, it, it comes in the wrong color. And we go, God, do you love us? How could this happen? Maybe not exactly that, but we find ourselves in those circumstances where we're questioning. And we're not bringing God into every circumstance. We're not facing life with Him and going, these things are incidental. I mean, imagine this little girl. What we see, how she responds in this circumstance means that she looks at, at war and massacre of her people and, and being enslaved as an incidental. There's a God who's a lot bigger than this. That's what she was saying. And this guy who's my enemy, he needs help from this God. That's a heroic faith. And that's the faith that we are not just called to live, but the faith that is in our hands, in our hearts, if we believe in Jesus Christ if we believe He's our Savior, that He won a victory over death and hell and the cross, that is our faith. And we can be exercising that faith. But so often, because of the comfort of our circumstances, our situation, we, we don't. And our little problems become big issues and the focus of our lives and, and we're trying to keep up and be as comfortable as everybody around us rather than going, hey, we, we've got a different priority here. It's the gospel. And anything that happens to me, anything that happens to me, as long as it's for the gospel and I don't even have to understand it, I, I'm willing to accept it. That's what Paul was saying. That's what he was saying in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. He was saying, hey, whatever happens, I've been in prison before, I'm in prison again. He was hoping to go share the gospel in Spain. He's trapped in Rome, he's in prison, he's facing what we know historically is an eventual death, the hands of the Romans. He's laughing. Maybe not laughing, but he's, he's going, hey, it's all good. The people are attacking me, uh, the enemies of, of Jesus Christ. He's saying in that same verses, he's saying, there are people who are even preaching the gospel who are against me. I'm not concerned. Enemies from without, enemies from within, as long as the gospel, he says, this is, this is like I never would have believed. Never would have believed this. He always went in, uh, someone was talking about it in the last day or so goes to the synagogue first and then starts ministering to the Gentiles that's his, his usual method of, of attacking air, an area with the gospel but this time he went to Rome as a prisoner well there it is the gospel message is, is, is trapped in a prison how can the gospel be shared in Rome when he's in prison and he's saying Hey, it's turned out for, for the good. The gospel's going forward. He's saying there are even those in Caesar's household. He wasn't simply spreading the gospel with, with, with those regular everyday people, but the gospel was infiltrating the highest ranks of the Roman Empire. He had prisoners, or he was a prisoner, and, and Caesar's own guard was holding him. And you can imagine Paul sharing the gospel with them. He wasn't curled up in a ball, going, woe is me. He was sharing the gospel. They were hearing him teach and preach and talk with those who were coming to visit him. And you know what's amazing? In the final greetings of Philippians, he says greetings from the brothers here in Rome, especially from those of Caesar's household. The gospel 
had infiltrated Caesar's household. Isn't that amazing? We don't understand what God's doing. And we think it's all bad. Things aren't good. We've lost our hope. We've lost our hope in our God and, and what he can do. This little girl didn't. And I applaud this little girl and her willingness to be used by God. And, but I don't want you to give you the idea that Elisha failed or fell short. But I do want to talk a little bit about his role. He was the representative of the people of God at that time. He was like the John Pipers, the Ravi Zacharias, the John MacArthur, the expert theologian, spokesperson with precise wisdom. Go to YouTube. You'll get the whole story right there in a very effective way. And he, Elisha was visible. It was a forceful, the hand of God working through him. That was his contribution to the event. But he was not, in this circumstance, an unconventional, incarnational, cross-cultural missionary. He wasn't. He was like an author who, who writes a book, a good book, and sends it out. But he never talks to the majority of the people who read that book. It's true, it's good, but that's not his role. I mean, think of what he did. Naaman comes to his house and he sends a messenger. Go tell him Washington, Jordan. And Naaman almost missed it. Why? Because Elisha was not attached to the message. Now, I'm not saying that was a, a, Elisha's bad. Elisha was doing exactly what God told him to do. I believe that. But do you see the difference? We are always looking at, at pastors or the guys on YouTube or the guys who are writing the books and going, oh, I wish I could say what he says in the way he says it and be as effective as... You know What? That's not our role. And that's not their role in a lot of circumstances. When they go home, they have neighbors. You see John MacArthur leaning on the fence? Neighbor says, I got problems. John MacArthur says, read this book. <laughs> the book comes sailing back over the fence. I mean, those guys in, in circumstances, they are the missionary. They are the one who is sharing a personal faith flesh on flesh with other people. And we shouldn't be wishing that we could be making YouTube videos that explain some doctrine, some truth in a way that... So we should be thinking, what can I do in my circle of influence? The people I run into day and day or the people I should run into. The people I should connect with. We always want the answers, but you know what? Some of the most effective ministry happens when we're working out the answers to tough questions with people. Everybody hates a know-it-all. Don't they? One of the guys who lives right beside us, he works on the farm where we live. And, and I talk to him. We've talked about different things. And... and one day he says to me, no, Steve, don't want to talk today. I know you, you got the answer. You're right. You'll be right. You, you got an answer for everything I tell you. And I just oh, yeah, that's maybe part of the problem. But, you know, if we, if we were honest and we, we shared with somebody and they said, you know, I doubt it. And you go, yeah, sometimes I do too. I haven't got it all figured out. I'm working at it too. That's our role. Working things out with the people who live around us. Developing the relationships and friendships with these people. And, and sharing faith with them. And it's not something we control. That faith, it's God's faith. We're, we're working it out. We're 
we're trying to grow in it. We're exercising it. We're building it up. And, and it, that's the privilege we have. I was talking to some guys last week. And, and it was actually the board of our agency. And they were asking me some questions about, you know, just my connection with churches and what I, what I and I, I said, you know what? I see the church in Canada giving up the privilege of being involved in missions. We're giving up the privilege. God has given us this incredible opportunity. And it's not one or the other. It's not, oh, we pioneers, unreached peoples. If you're not out there with unreached people, you're not doing anything. No, we realize that the church, and I've heard this again and again over this weekend, the church is on a mission. One singular mission. We are to take the gospel from God through our lives to other people. And when the church is being the church here, you will have people going from here too. The church will bear fruit. Not simply locally, but internationally. And that's where the struggle is. The church has lost its mission, lost the sense in which it's, it's every one of us as individuals living out our faith in a very real world, in a very real way, sorry, before the world, before those who are part of our world. And we need to get back on track with that. question is do we see God's purpose for us in his plan it's a very personal purpose a very personalized purpose we need to be in love with God we know what that means biblically it's not just a fuzzy feeling it's like trusting him and learning how much we trust him and can and, and can be confident in him and we're being obedient. That's all part of that love relationship. We obey Him because we trust Him. That's a parental child relationship, isn't it? We need to be in love with God. We need to be living His gospel. We heard it before actions and words. We need to be living His gospel. We need to be led by His grace both the plodding and the powerful. Both the, the regular everyday being led by His grace to do just the regular everyday things where we get out of bed and go to our work and, and, and mix with people but in a way that honors Him. And you know what? There will be those times where we come home and we go, Wow! God worked through me in a powerful way today. God gave me this. And you know, so many times it's, it's not scripted by us. It, it wasn't something we strategized. I was talking with a pastor two weeks ago, and we were just talking about this idea of strategic planning and missions and how, you know, we should probably be thinking more about living out biblical principles because we don't have any power over <laughs> these strategies but we do have the ability to honor and obey God. And this pastor, as I'm talking about it, he goes, you know what? Every time that God has used me in a major way in my community, and there were some major ways, he says, it was completely unplanned by me. And he's just a, a simple guy preaching the Word of God. And then all of a sudden, in his neighborhood, there was this huge accident, a bus, a lot of deaths. And he just called the municipal government and said, hey, we're open to whatever. He was in Ottawa at the time. And he had two opportunities to preach the gospel. I think it was around 2,000 people each time. Just people coming in to their church just because they'd offered 
And then the, the next time it was the Danforth shooting in Greektown. Just their church was right there where the shooting took place and they opened the doors and it became a grieving center and, and a place where they ministered to people. You can't strategize that. But you can live out biblical principles on a daily basis. And God will use you. God will use us in those, those ways here and now and, and extending to the world. There's some principles in this story. God's best work will often seem arbitrary and almost always go against our better judgment. His big work. You know, there's that regular stuff we just carry on with. But when he's at work, a lot of times we don't really appreciate it at first. So we must be faithful, ready in season and out. Like this little girl who lived her life. You know, you think of it. Naaman was desperate for a cure, but this girl's life must have been pretty convincing. You think about that. Was it more he was desperate or was it more that she was convincing? I, I don't know. But she was convincing enough that he went and made a request to his king in a pagan land, uh, please send me somewhere so I can get a, a miraculous healing. He was convinced. I wonder how she lived her life. I wonder what it was. Was it the fact that, hey, she's been through all she's been through and she still believes in this God. She still has confidence in him. Another principle, we should not try to accommodate the gospel to fit preconceived notions or what the hearer would like best. And we, sh that's, and we shouldn't expect those who've just expected, uh, accepted the gospel to have all their theology straight, all their ducks in a row. You think of it, you look at it, what Elisha did there, the first part of that principle. Naaman says, oh, I thought he would have come and, and called out and waved his hand over the area where the leprosy was. And No, he didn't have to do that. We don't have to go out and fit what everybody wants out there. We just need to go and God will lead. We need to be, say, God, lead me, help me to speak to this person and the next person and the next person. And I don't have to think, oh, they're interested in, you know, I look at my little community. We live out in the middle of fields. There are six houses around us, okay? And then fields with manure spread on them. And it smells sometimes. And, and I look at it, and all these guys, they're all car guys. And I'm not a car guy. I'm a, I'm a woodworker guy or something along that line. I'm not a car guy. And I think this doesn't make sense strategically. But am I still responsible? Do I still have opportunity? Do I have to go and make some parallels to mechanics? And, you know, God is like uh, the, the, the divine mechanic. And No, I don't. I don't. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to fit with the way, their way of thinking. I just have to share in a real way God's love, God's gospel with them. That's what I have to do. And I don't have to expect it. If that guy makes a move and, and, and responds, that he all of a sudden, okay, and this is how Christians walk. And you have to do things exactly like me. And this was something really interesting for me in this story. You see what happens? Naaman, after he's healed, he goes, I'm going to leave and I want two mule loads. Two mule loads of dirt from Israel. Why? Because the pagan belief at that time was that gods were territorial gods. And if I'm going to worship the God of Israel, I've got to take a little bit of Israel with me. Kind of like those those bottles of sand from Israel that Jorge is selling to pay off the second floor 
He's not doing it. I'm joking. He's not doing that. I, but you know what? This guy had this false, this false belief. Did Elisha go, whoa, 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 wait a second. This guy admitted, you know what? I have to help the king go to temple to worship. False god, Rimmon, remember? He says, will God forgive me if I go and bow down with the king before this idol? What's Elisha say? Go in peace. Elisha didn't disciple at all, did he? No discipleship. Now, I'm not saying, oh, if people have theological things, just leave them. I'm saying, this is not our priority. This was not his priority at this moment. Who was involved in the discipleship of this, of this, of this general? Who would it have been? The little girl again. Now, I don't think she would have necessarily sat him down and had discipleship classes, but through her life, through the conversation in that home, she would be the one probably who he'd be hearing from about who this God is and how he's to be worshipped and how omniscient, omnipresent he is. But so many times we're so concerned that, that you know, okay, we give people this orthodox education. Okay, if you believe in Jesus, now you have to do this, this, and this, and this. Is that how it happened with us? Or did we learn, as we learned about God, we learned how we could honor Him, how we should worship Him, how we should live for Him. And it's a process of growth. That's a good principle for us. Our witness for God is not primarily based on our position or on our theology, but on our practical theology, or better said, our right relationship with God. Now you're starting to think, does this guy have something against theology? No. I am all for biblical, proper biblical theology, and I think we need to get it right. But what I'm saying here is more important than the books we have on our shelf, than the things that we say, this is my, my belief structure. It's how I live. That practical theology. Because theology is never yours until you're living it. Until it makes a difference in your life. It reminds me of a question my son had for me. My son always has questions for me, and he always hates my answers that start with, it depends. He always wants a this or that. And, and so this is an important question. You'll want to listen to it and the answer. What is the best survival knife? I mean, he's looked at a lot of survival knives. There are a lot of them out there, a lot of different options, a lot of different... You know, and, and you can look and search and study and find the best one. And I had the best answer. He said, what is the best survival knife? And I said, the one that you have with you when you get lost. Think about that. Theologically speaking. What theology is the best? the one that you own. Yes, it has to be biblical. But this is it. It's not just about coming to the right church. It's not just about knowing what the Bible says. It's about living our faith, living out a biblical faith. And that is how we're going to be effective in reaching this world. You might have a new faith that's, that's no better than one of those little pocket knives that you get out of a gumball machine. But start using it. Start sharing that gospel recently discovered with other people. And if you don't have questions, they're going to have questions and you're going to have to go, 
oh, I got to get that figured out. And when we start living our faith, when we have hope in, in our faith, because it's not really our faith, it's something that God has given to us, then we will be on track in terms of fulfilling the mission that Jesus Christ has left with us as his church. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us, each one of us as individuals today, to recognize that you are giving us an opportunity to once again enter into this great privilege of being a part of your gospel plan and purposes in this world. You included us through our salvation. And if there are those who haven't been included, Lord, I pray that this day they would see the power of the cross of Jesus Christ, of an eternal transformation through your faith. But those of us, Lord, who do know you, I pray that we would start living that faith. That we would take our circumstances and realize it doesn't depend on our circumstances, but take our circumstances and live within those circumstances a faith that is powerful, that comes from you. A faith that is loving, that comes from you. A faith that is real, because it is connected with you. Lord, help us, help us to be obedient and to know the joy of working in concert with you in this world for your glory, for your gospel. Amen.